fallout, smoke, women crying for their sons because their sons are not, Romans killing riotous groups that are rising up, free Judea, free our people, autonomy for Israel. You had Herod and Edomite and his dynasty, Herod's ruling, killing any potential threat, any potential Messiah. Then you had the Pharisees and the Sadducees that we learn from Josephus are not Jews by birth. No. Brother and sister, they are there. We are not lost. We are scattered. We are original Hebrews. Let's go! All praise and be to the most higher Yeah, I say it. From my, I was a fortune to meet my grandparents. Whom from childhood had always made us to understand that we are one of the lost tribes of Israel. One of the lost tribes of Israel. One of the lost tribes of Israel. Hey, so now we are on our way from Ahafia to Arochuku. So we're going traveling all around. This is also an ancient city, the Warriors. Yeah. They call it the Ephraimite. Okay. The Ephraimite. Let me show you around. Yeah, Britain, the Ephraimite. Yes, Ephraimite. Yeah. Ephraimite. Yes, Ephraimite. So they're living. This particular place, they uh, say that they're from the tribe of Ephraim. Yeah, Ephraimites. The Ephraimites. And ethnicity is a cult. What's up, Zion Dynasty? This is your favorite dreaded Israelite, the man, the myth, and the legend, Mr. JB Zion, y'all, show me some love, show me some love. Family, this is going to be an action-packed one. This is going to be a nice, good old-fashioned Bible study. I hope y'all got y'all a pen, paper, all that good stuff. So first, family, y'all like this video up, comment, share, su subscribe. Also, y'all spread the word about the Sefer. I'm almost thinking about postponing it from not tomorrow, Shabbat. But the next Shabbat, just to get the word out, I haven't, we haven't had nearly as many, as many, um, requests for it. I'm trying to tally those up and I'm like, man, it's either the word hasn't got out or it's not as many people as last time being interested in the Seifer. So y'all spread the word and also y'all comment. I might do a poll to see if you guys want me to push this, the announcement of the three winners to next Shabbat to give more people an opportunity to come in and that kind of thing. Also, I have some exciting news with Seifer. They offered to partner with the channel. Y'all, I'm so excited because they've seen how many people have been um, mentioning me when they're buying Seifer. They've been saying, they've been um, doing a shout out to Zion Dynasty. Um, as you guys may or may not know on Seifer's website, um, they do ask you how you found out about them. So I think that's what's going on. A lot of Zion Dynasty has been flooding them. So they reached out to me about partner, mar, partnering with them. Y'all, I'm excited. I'm stumbling over my words and that kind of thing. But I'm so excited about that. Um, so I'm going to have a link to see for on the web, on in the channel. Um, not today or tomorrow's lesson. I still have to reach back out to them and confirm everything. Um, but that's going to um, save you guys 10%. That allow you guys to buy directly from the link on the channel um, that also supports the channel because 10 percent of those proceeds also go back to zion dynasty so it saves you guys 10 percent it gives 10 percent to the channel and it makes it easier for y'all not to run into that madness that i've been hearing a lot of y'all have been finding seifers for 2.99 and 300 dollars a lot of madness um that cuts that price in half i think it's about a hundred dollars off their website um not including the 10% discount. So I'm going to have that link and I'm going to do the three free giveaways either tomorrow Shabbat or next Shabbat. I'm, I'm going to do a poll about it because it's not as many people. I, I don't think the word, the, the um, I think the algorithm slowed down family uh, when I um, didn't do those videos for a couple of weeks. Um, that did affect the algorithm and I think that's why a lot of people don't, don't know about it. Some people are finding out. Some people are telling me, JB, we don't see it in our notifications. We're not getting notifications about the lesson. So I might push the um, 
the giveaway off to next Shabbat. But it's up to you guys. Y'all comment down below if y'all want to push that off to next Shabbat to give more people an opportunity to comment that they want that Cefer. And then I'm also going to be working with Cefernet to be able to save you guys the ones that want to buy it from the channel. Okay, so that's a lot, guys. So it's a lot going on. I'm also networking with a lot of brothers. Y'all hang tight. A lot of brothers that have been reaching out to me that want to network behind the scenes. Um, a lot of Moorish elders, a lot of just Israelite elders, those that are in the continent of Africa, those that are in the Americas, just a lot. Those that are in Israel, I've been getting a lot of different brothers and sisters reaching out and I am behind on catching up on all this stuff and all that kind of thing. But I, I do hear you all and you guys will be hearing from me shortly. So family, we're going to jump back into the Bible study lesson. I had to upgrade my MacBook to extend the amount of storage space on my desktop when I'm doing these screen recordings, y'all, because they kind of go kind of long and it, it, it maxed it out. So last session, I did not intend for it just to end like that. I ran out of storage space, so I had to do some things, purchase some more space, purchase me an external hard drive and some things so I can do these lessons so y'all can hear these scriptures. So we're going to jump into a family. We're going to be dealing with, y'all, y'all check this out now. The Book of Mormon, the Stick of Ephraim, and the Stick of Judah. Now, y'all, we're going to do a review from that last Bible study. I'm a, All these precepts y'all see up here, we are going to touch those precepts. We're going to deal with those precepts, and then I'm going to introduce you guys to the Book of Mormon and explain it for you guys that don't know what this is. Basically, the Book of Mormon is apocryphal text, basically, in a nutshell, right? Now, a lot of you know about the apocrypha. The Sefer, that's why I bring up the Sefer. The Sefer has a lot of apocrypha text. All of the original 1611 King James book, King James book um, books are in the Sefer, including additions, like the additional chapters that were removed out of the book of Esther. Y'all, this stuff gets deeper and deeper. I'm telling y'all, the additional chapters that were removed out of the book of Esther are in the Sefer. Not just that, but the hidden chapter 29 of the book of Acts that goes into the Shephardic Ephrati that Paul the Apostle was going to, to Spain to go after those Shephardic Israelites with the gospel. He was going after Ephraim, our northern kingdom family. So that's also in the Sefer. But a lot of y'all know about the Sefer, which has the best array of these apocryphal texts. You can buy a separate apocrypha, but I don't think it contains the hidden chapters of Acts chapter 29 and that kind of thing. But we thought that the King James Version and, and the Apocrypha is everything, right? We thought that is all the hidden books, all our hidden records that they've hidden from us, that our people were not aware of, right? That the nations have conspired to keep our people from our, our history, right? We thought that was it. So then comes the Book of Mormon. And I was with a lot of you guys. I didn't know that much about it. I ran into it investigating Ephraim, actually. When I started digging into the birthright of Ephraim, what does that mean in terms of eschatology? What does that mean in terms of Africa? What does that mean in terms of African Americans and those Africans that were in the Americas, those Moors before Christopher Columbus? What does that mean for Israel? What does that mean for the 12 tribes? What is Ephraim's role? So in searching for Ephraim and the stick of Ephraim in the hand of, uh, or the stick of Joseph rather, in the hand of Ephraim, family, that's when I came across the Book of Mormon. So the Book of Mormon starts saying how a family of these uh, northern kingdom Josephites had come to the Americas thousands of years ago, family. They've been over there for thousands of years. So they go to the Americas and um, the Most High warns them not to go to Judea and he warns other northern kingdom families to get out of there. This is this connects the history of why you had Ephraimites in Africa. This is why you had Ephraimites in Nigeria. And this is why you had those Ephraimite Moors in the Americas. So I was like, wow, there is there is scripture that goes into that northern kingdom account that connects Africa, that connects Africans, Israelites, the American Israelites, that diaspora that explains that's going on. So so I started saying, OK, maybe this is some white folk stuff, just like a lot of y'all thought. But I'm going to show y'all some scriptures in the Book of Mormon, uh, in the sealed portion of Mormon, which is like an additional set of books, which is deep, y'all. It's kind of like the King James and the Apocrypha. So the Book of Mormon has additional seals, right? Sealed records. The sealed portion of Mormon. Then you have the sealed portion of Ephraim. You have Pearl of the Great Price. And then you have, I am forgetting one, Doctrines and Covenants, right? So we're going to touch these scriptures because I thought that was a bunch of Esau man-made stuff. But y'all, the Most High knows we are reawakening to our history. We are finding this stuff out. We've been in captivity. 
And I'm going to show y'all it, where it talks about America. It talks about the great European Roman Empire being the beast that the devil speaks of. All of these prophetic videos, y'all check out World War III, where I've been going through that history about the captivities, Egypt, Assyria, uh, Babylon, the Medo-Persian Empire, the Greco-Roman Empire, right? And the new Roman Empire, the Book of Mormon and the Doctrines and Covenants goes into this history. I said, wait a second, I thought this was a white man's book, right? Now, that's why I've been telling y'all, we've been thinking that, oh, Mormonism, that's some white folks stuff. White folks are not going to write. That's the same thing our, our comedic brothers try to say about the Bible. Oh, that's the white man's book that he used to pitch out on slavery. No, no, no. Why would the white man's book talk about Israel being in slavery for 400 years, then the Most High going, y'all better hear me, then the Most High is going to come redeem them. And those that put them in captivity going to go into captivity. Now, why would the right white man that got you in slavery write about the God that fights for the people in slavery? It's our people haven't been reading. We've been thinking that the nations have been make, making up some kind of book to enslave us. The best way to keep your enemies close is to have their own history. Y'all gotta hear me. This is the wisdom that the nations have been operating in. They knew that they could monitor you better by having your culture, having your records, so they can modify if you're waking up or if you try to rally, right? Because the best way to rally is to know yourself. The nations know the power of knowing your history. So they kept your history close to them. And this is the same thing, family, that we're going to see with the Book of Mormon. I'm going to do a Bible study connection with Ezekiel 37 and in 1 Samuel to show y'all Ephraim, show y'all the two sticks, and show you Mormon or the Book of Mormon and its accompanying text being the stick of Ephraim or the records of Ephraim, just like the Judeo scriptures are the record of Southern Kingdom, are the Jews, right? So we're gonna deal with that. First, we're gonna do a quick review, family, because this is a lot. We're gonna deal with a lot of great, y'all take some notes. Um, if y'all have any interest in getting some of these scriptures, I can kind of point you in the right direction. Most of them are on Amazon, but I'm still collecting some of them myself. Um, but if you guys are interested in getting a copy, most of them are on Amazon and that kind of thing. Uh, the Book of Mormon, I think Pearl of the Great Price, Doctrines and Covenants and that kind of thing. If you want to have your complete records of these books they done stole from our people. So we're going to do a review about Ephraim, um, born in Africa, born in Egypt, um, the father, the leading tribe, the noble tribe of the 10 tribes. So basically, family, what I've been teaching you guys and showing you all is how Ephraim Northern Kingdom has been neglected, family. Those 10 tribes known as the tribes belonging to Ephraim have been neglected. And I've been arguing with you guys and arguing with some other elders in the, in the community, which uh, I, I, I apologize for that family. Um, we got to understand that the Most High is showing different puzzle pieces to each one of us. When the Most High shows us something, that's not for us to condemn our other brothers that don't see it yet. The Most High is waking us all up, right? So I have been arguing with you guys, and, and I could have done that a little bit better, but I get passionate, family, that the majority of us Israelites come from the 10 out of the 12 tribes, right? It's self-explanatory. There's, there's 12 tribes of Israel. The majority of them fall within those 10 tribes that belong to Joseph, right? So the most of us that have gone through the transatlantic, most of us that have native blood that goes back to those African Moors that came over to the Americas, Nephi and that kind of thing, most of us belong to Ephraim. That is the 10 tribes of Joseph or the Northern Kingdom, right? Why is that important? Because the Jewish people know that. Y'all understand what I'm saying? The Jewish rabbis, the Jewish scholars, the Jewish historians, right? Know very well that the bulk of Northern Kingdom was in Africa and that a family of them went to the Americas, right? Uh, Lost Tribes and Promised Lands is a book by, um, uh, where is that book? Um, Sanders, Lost Tribes and Promised Land. He goes into those native tribes. Most of these native tribes that they're talking about are these Negro Israelites. You get into your Cherokee, Choctaw, Chickasaw Creek, Seminole Indians. They are Negro Moors that came from Morocco. This is why the Moors say that a Mexum or North and South America belonged to Morocco. It was an extension of Morocco. Because the people of Morocco, the founders of Morocco, are Ephrati Ephraimites. So they knew about their brethren in the Americas because some of them stayed in the African continent. Most of them got out of Canaan. I'm going to tell y'all. Most of Ephraims, the Most High told them to get out of there because he was going to judge them. So when the Assyrians fell, 
and circa 600 BC during the, the, the beginning of the Babylonian Empire to about 590 um, BC, you see a lot of Ephraimites going to Morocco and found Nigeria, right? Some of those Moroccan Ephraimites also went to the Americas. This is the Book of Mormon that accounts Nephi, whose father was Lehi, that goes through that history. So what's happened, family, is white folks have divided our history, right? The nations have split us up, right? But they call us African-American for a reason. They know we're Northern Kingdom Israelites. But the beauty is we have the, this so many different black power groups that if we all brought our records together, the truth of the history of our family is linked to Moorish Ephraimites. We are the Moors. We are Ephrati. Those Moroccan Ephraimites that had been in Africa and a lot of them went to the Americas, this reconciles the native Cherokee, Chickasaw, those Ephraimites, Nephi, with the greater Northern Kingdom that was in Africa. Most of them um, did not go to Canaan. They stayed in the continent of Africa. So I'm just trying to get you guys to think historically about that. Um, before I jump into these scriptures, let me show y'all a little bit of that history real quick. Right, let me show you. So Ephraimite Moors, I found this from a Moorish elders website. A lot of our elders have so much wisdom, family. If you know elders that know this history of who we are, whether they be Moors or elder Israelites, get under them because they know things that you can't replicate their wisdom. That's why the Most High said he would turn the hearts of the fathers to the children, right? We got to come together, the strength of the young man, the wisdom of our elders. Now, let me show you this article that this elder Moray, um, this elder Bay, this article that he put together. Now, Ephraimite Moors. Now, the majority of the Israelite tribes resided under the authority of the house of Joseph, which in turn was ruled by the tribe of Ephraim, the birthright tribe. Just prior, and I'm a, we're going to go through the scriptures about that birthright. We're going to deal with Esau's kingdom. We're going to deal with the great European beast system. We're going to deal with that family. Now, just prior to the expulsion of the northern kingdom in 722 BC, this is when they were first taken over by the Assyrians in 722 BC, uh, many Moorish Ephraimites, Moorish just a title for Negro, uh, but it's a royal title because it was applied to the house of Joseph during the time of the Moors and that kind of thing. So many Moors, Ephrati, or Ephraimites, of the house of Yosef fled to Arabia. This is why they united during the time of the Moors. These were Negro Arabians. Those ones that was in there, um, now there were some palest complexion Arabs, I'm not saying that, but what who are not highlighted are those Negro Arabians that were in Saudi. Those Moors don't get a lot of credit. We even either know about the Black Moors, the straight out Negroes, or we think all the Arabian Moors were, were white-ish or pale-faced, right? That is not historically accurate. The indigenous people in there are related to the rest of them African Negroes. Now watch this. So these Moorish Ephraimites of the house of Joseph fled to Arabia, Yemen, Ethiopia, right? Beta Israel. During the time of the prophet Muhammad, they were commonly known as Bani Kanako, or Bani Arfida, Afridi, Ephraimites, are Ephraimite tribes. The latter were known to have first settled in Ethiopia, the Beta Israel. That's where that tribe of Dan comes in, and that's where Solomon's seed is a lot of different waves of Israelites in Ethiopia. I'm telling y'all, the majority of the African continent is Israel. I'm, I'm gonna pick that. I didn't say that on the channel from the beginning, right? Ethnically speaking. Now they do, they might practice different customs. We're not talking about religion, we're talking about the history of their lineage, right? So they first settled in Ethiopia before arriving at Medina. This is why a lot of Yoruba, Igbo say we come from Mecca, we come from Medina. They had family that was there. In Medina, they were known to merge with the native Midianite tribes. That This goes into Joseph, uh, Moses' family, Jethro's family, uh, these Midianite Afers. Midianite tribes of which the most dominant were the sons of Afer, called Bani Gafir. In this regard, the Ephraimites were also referred to as part of the original Afra. Now, many of the Moorish Ephraimites continued to move westward, ultimately settling in Morocco, Mauritania, which is the farthest west um, on, the, on, Af on the African continent, and Mali, the Sankai Mali empires. These were Israelite empires, right? They were offshoots of our people, the Moors that were ruling, right? In North Africa, they became known as the Banu Ifran, this is where the continent is named after Afri, or Ephraim, or Wifran, meaning the children are tribe of Ephraim. While their tribal lands were known as the land of Afri, right? Ephraimites. So Africa was named after that. It is formed 
It is from this etym etymology that the Roman name Africa is derived. Ka is the Roman suffix for the people of. Now, there were many variants for the name Ephraim or Ephraim, Ephraim, such as Afar, Efri, Ifri, Ephraimdi, um, Ephorin, Fren, Wafren, Yefren, Yafren, Yefran, right? A Moorish Ephraimite queen called the Kahina, a El Kahina, or Daya. I showed y'all that clip in Nigeria where they said they had a city named after the Ephraimite queen, the Ephraimite princess, right? The warrior. That's Kahina. That's Daya. The Nigerians still know this history. Is well remembered for her resistance to the Arab invasion of North Africa. Now, that was an internal strife between the Moors of Arabia converting the whole continent to Islam. Ethnically, they were the same family. But religious wise, they believed that Islam was the religion for the black man. And they said we needed to reject Torah because the Ish people and Edom and the Christian North had hijacked the religion. I do not agree with this because I know the way I said that. It'd be like, whoa, that sounds like it makes sense, JB. It does make sense. But that's that stumbling block of the doggone um, of Islam and Christianity. Both of them are us deviating from our ethnic uh, original culture. Right. So this was reactionary. Our people becoming Islamic was reactionary to create our own group because our identity was already in the process of being taken by the foreigners. Right. By the colonizers, by um, Edom. Right. So the Arab invasion went in and a lot of these um, Ephraimites that stood fast to Torah, El Kahina, they said, we are Torah only. We will fight as black Jews, Israelites, and we're going to fight for Torah. We will not become y'all new religion that you didn't came up with, Muhammad, right? We will not do that. So they fought against them uh, during the early part of the 8th century of the Common Era. Uh, while Abraham Ha'afrati is remembered as the first Ephraimite king of Wifran. Now, in Mauritania and Mali, the Moorish Ephraimites became known as Bafar or Bafar. Um, also, side note, I do want to mention this five-pointed star is the um, ring of Solomon, the five-pointed star. Now, Morocco's original flag was the Star of David. I just wanted to bring that up now. They had the Star of David on their flag before the Ish people. They changed it to the seal of Sol I mean, the ring of Solomon. They knew who they were, and they knew they were Ephrati. They did this as a political move and to protect their history from people that didn't know their history. Our people did stuff like that because they knew only the true Israelites would recognize this move, which the Most High shown it to the diaspora. Now, let's keep going. Now, uh, where was I? Here we go. In Mauritania and Mali, the Moorish Ephraimites became known as Balfour, like the Balfour Declaration. This was the declaration to clear out the land from all these Moors. Britain did it and gave it to Lord Rothschild. Now, that's the history of during uh, World War II. This classification included the Mandi tribes. Now, a lot of these was in the Americas, and it's going to go into that. Um, which the most prominent are the Mandingo. A lot of them were in the Americas, were the original Native Americans, who were also known as the Malinke or Soninke. In 1311, Abakbar uh, the second, the emperor of Mali, set sail across the Atlantic. Now, he set sail. Watch this with a thousand vessel fleet and thus began the settlement of the house of joseph in the americas this let me let me clarify that this is the moorish settlement the most recent settlement now they had already been trading and going back and forth between the continent and you already had josephites way back during the time of the of nephi in 600 bc this is why these moors said we're going over there and we're going over there to stay right because they had already been catching hell from the christian north so a lot of this house of Joseph said we go into the Americas with our copper colored Negro brethren, right? The voyage is recorded by the Egyptian historian Ibn uh, Fadlula al-Umari. The Malian Ephraimites, Balfour, joined members of the Dini or Danite tribes like those in the Beta Israel in Ethiopia, such as the Navajo and Apache. Apache. These are your original Negro natives that our people come from now, along with the Cherokee. It's going to get into it. The Chickasaw, Choctaw, um, Seminole Creek Indians and populating the Westlands, which were promised to the children of Israel. So even this Moorish brother knows that them Americans, those Americas were promised to Ephraim, were promised to the children of Israel. So the Moors know 
uh, the, the camps know, <laughs> the Book of Mormon go, I'm going to show y'all that, that these lands belong to us as much as Africa. Now, watch this now, because we got to think about a world to come, family. We got to think bigger. We're going to have a, 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 a headquarters base. We're going to have other governing lands, because Esau Empire about to fall, y'all. And the next one up is the so-called Negro. Now, watch this now. In the Americas, the Ephraimite Mandingo Moors divided into several tribes, including the Madonna, Natik, and Natico. Now, this is like Chris, Christmas Attic's lineage. In this regard, a Moravian missionary visited the Nanticoke Nation on Maryland's eastern shore. Now, Maryland was also where uh, Matthias de Sousa, the black Portuguese Sephardic Moor came, the Israelite Moorish Efrati. He was the first black um, person to serve on the Maryland uh, legislature, I think as mayor. But the articles say he was a black Portuguese Jew. But they say he was the first African-American. See, white folks knew we were the same people. They knew this. They knew that the Moors that were coming over, that they were Ephraimite Israelites, and that the tribes that they encountered over here in the Americas were Moorish Ephraimites. They were of the house of Joseph, right? So, uh, sure to compile a vocabulary of their language and found they were speaking pure African Mandingo. Why were the natives speaking African Mandingo? Y'all, we're going to deal with the Olmec statue as well. We're going to deal with the pyramids that were found in the Americas. This connects that they took that African culture with them when they came to the Americas. Africa owned both of them. The Moroccans were the royal kingdom that kept track of this history. Now, Crispus Attucks, a Moorish natic, was the first to be killed during the Boston Massacre. The Ephraimite Moors were also known as the original Black, Cherokee, Choctaw, Chickasaw, Creek, and Seminole Indians. My grandmothers, she lives in Choctaw County, Alabama. They know this history very well. Cherokee on the Cherokee side, my grandmother, my dad's. So my mom's grandmother is Cherokee. My dad's, or my mom's mother is Cherokee. My dad's mother, I have documentation going back to the fifth on one lineage, seventh generation Cherokee. And as you guys know, my paternal lineage is Yoruba Nigerian, right? Now, how did a Yoruba slave marry these people? Now, I got documentation of my own family history. We don't know they was the same people. And, I, and I've talked to a lot of my family. They knew they recognized them as the same people because they knew this history. The Yoruba, those Nigerian Ephraimites and Israelites are related to these black Cherokee Choctaw, not the ones they show you on TV, looking like they are different species, but there were natives here that looked just like Negroes. Just like it's, it's hard to see that with, they even got Moses looking white. When you look at a lot of Hispanic populations, they don't show you the Afro-Brazilians. Esau does this in their propaganda family. So you have to see through what they show you because they're not going to show you Israelites being black. They still showing white Jesus in 2022. So I'm telling y'all, the original people that were here were Ephraimite Moors and they were the founders of the Cherokee, Choctaw, Chickasaw, Creek and Seminole Indians and all their affiliate tribes, Blackfoot, and those that come through these uh, major groups, right? Some members of the Balfour Ephraimite Moors migrated from Mali and settled in Nigeria, and that's been a long process of the Nigerian Israelites, the Igbo and that kind of thing, where they became known as the Biafras or the Biafrans. The Biafran War, the Nigerian War, they was the same people. They were Afar. They were Ephraimites. Um, the two Afras, this goes back to the Midianite Afra as well as um, Abraham's great grandson Ephraim. The Moorish Ephraimite by Afras became the leaders or the chieftains of the Igbo. And the Igbo still keep eight day circumcision, eight day naming ceremonies. Um, they have the highest rate of circumcision in the world. And the surname Ephraim is most common in Nigeria out of every country in the world. The surname Ephraim shows up the most in Nigeria. They know this history which was symbolized by the wearing of the traditional red fez. We know a lot of Moors that comes from their Moors history of Moor Shefrati, which is customarily worn to this day by Igbo chiefs or chieftains. In 1993, an Igbo by the name of Shima from Imo State in Nigeria petitioned the Israeli rabbi, rabbinite for recognition of the Igbo as members of the tribe of Ephraim. I've been trying to tell y'all these things. Rudolph R. Windsor from Babylon and Timbuktu writes about the Ephraimites of Mali and Morocco settling in Yoruba land, bingo, where they became known by their neighbors as Imo Yokoyin 
are the strange people. However, they know themselves to be the Benny Ephraim, the majority of captives taken to the Americas during the transatlantic. So they colonized Ephraim on one end and they took the rest of their brothers from the west coast of Africa into slavery. All right. And they were descended from the greater Igbo nation, these Yoruba Ephraimites of Biafra. That's why they fight it for no reason. The white man got them fighting so he can take the oil and the gold and that kind of thing. And therefore were under the authority of the tribe of Ephraim um, and the house of Joseph. So I'm telling y'all, on every way you cut it, y'all, <laughs> Joseph is everywhere. Ephraim, I'm telling y'all, the coat of many colors. When they hated on Joseph, they tore his coat into many pieces. That's prophetically meaning Joseph would be scattered into all these different people groups. And Jacob, we're going to go to those scriptures, says that Ephraim is the fullness of the Gentiles family. Now, both the descendants of the Ephraimite Moors who arrived in the Americas before Columbus and those who came during the slave trade are the inheritors of the Western lands promised to the children of Israel, courtesy of the Elder Moor Bay. I'm telling y'all. If we would just sit down, and I have a, a elder bait um, that I plan on reaching out to. Um, I got an email from him. We're going to be working behind the scenes, y'all. There's some exciting stuff coming, y'all. The most high finna do these things. So I just wanted y'all to see this, that we are linked to our native brethren in a maxim. We are the same folks now. Now, I got something in the Jewish Encyclopedia. I don't want y'all to read that yet. Now, <laughs> now y'all see my... I get excited about this stuff, man. So um, 23 and me, you already see that they saw me as Ebo. Because the Yoruba Ephraimites are part of the greater greater Igbo people. We already know the Igbo are Israelites. Um, this is the Yoruba's oral tradition linking them to Ephraim as well. Saying they were banished in 1492 and that kind of history. Now that we kind of established that history family. It's going to make the scriptures make so much more sense when you understand history. Now let me see what my time looking like. Alright. So we covered a lot family in 30 minutes. We covered a lot. So the next half, we're going to deal with the scriptures and the stick of Ephraim. And I'm going to show y'all a beautiful revelation with David um, connecting all these things together. Right. And it's going to go deeper than him being an Ephraimite. Oh, I got something that most I showed me that's legendary family. Now, so we already know in Genesis 35 that Rachel died on the way to Bethlehem. Now, why is Bethlehem important? To let you know that David, the greatest king in the earth's history. Right. The greatest king that the Jews revere. The Muslims revere, Christians revere, he is linked to these Africans. I'm telling you, and these Negro Native Americans. That's why I go so hard because they know that there is a prophetic lineage linked to that black man, David. And they know that descendant of David is the black Messiah. That brings COINTELPRO. Well, I watch this. J. Edgar Hoover. Now, why did they say prevent the rise of a black Messiah? Why do they use Messiah when they talk about Negroes? They know who we are and they knew the prophecies. That's why they assassinated Dr. King, Fred Hampton, uh, Malcolm X, Marcus Garvey. They just, he just burnt him. I mean, he just, they just ruined his reputation and everything, right? That's why they assassinated the, just the fame, the character of these different leaders, Stokely Carmichael, Elijah Muhammad, the list goes on family. Nelson Mandela, they're fighting a prophecy that's linked to David the African that has a lineage of Ephraimites that out of that people that the Jewish scribes say Messiah and Ephraim will be in the gates of Rome so an Ephraimite will come out of the captivity in his own land in America well what JB I'm just I'm, I ain't gonna go wait a second we're gonna take it slow because I'm, I'm gonna show you what the white folks fear I'm gonna go and show it to you I know, I know a lot of y'all like, JB, you got to be careful sharing some of this stuff. Some of y'all email me and be like, you know, and I walk in wisdom with not showing y'all, you know, I got to show, I got to show y'all's people now, but I do know that there are people watching this and don't want this message to come out, but I got to share it with y'all to build y'all faith that there is a reason why our people are suffering. There's a reason why they want our people to not who we are, know who we are. There's a reason why they want to call you the absence of color. That's what black means. Black means the absence of color. Y'all Google it, right? They call you an absence of color and you are the colored people. They can't even call you Nigerian. They don't even want to call you Igbo. They don't even want to call you a native Cherokee. They don't want you to get nowhere near your history. Watch this now. So they said, let's just call them, call them black, right? There's a reason family we shot on the streets. Now, now watch this. So Rachel died in Bethlehem. Rachel is the grandmother of 
Ephraim and Manasseh. She is the mother of Joseph and Benjamin. Now, and I and shout out to the brother that posted the comment that family, let's deal with this with an open mind because there were Levites that were also in Bethlehem. And I love that comment because I think a lot of our people have got stagnant to think that only this tribe was in this border. Let the scripture speak, right? Now we're gonna see that Rachel died in a town that is a part of Judah's borders. That's where the confusion comes in. That's why I say, yes, Christ came out of Judah. Absolutely. We always hear about Jew and Judah and the Jews, right? But the mystery is there was a town within there that was a sacred town because their foremother died there. Africans are the only people that think like this to this day, that think about honoring the ancestors. Wherever their ancestors were buried, they created shrines for that. You got to think like that. And I'm going to show y'all in the book of Jasher that, that Joseph cried so bad at her grave. I mean, and let's, let's read it in the book of Jasher, chapter 42. Um, let me let you guys, book of Jasher 42. And I'm going to begin at verse 29. Now, or verse 28. And the Most High Yah saw the ambition of Joseph, saw the struggle that he was going through just to survive, right? He was being sold into slavery by his own brethren. Now, who specifically sold Joseph? Now, let's go back to the beginning. Verse 3. And Judah said unto them, What can we gain if we kill our brother? Because the Most High is going to require his blood from us. Now, this is what we need to do. Behold, this company of Ishmaelites. Now, watch this. Now, therefore, let come let us dispose of him to them, right? and let not our hand be upon him. So family, it was Judah's idea to sell Joseph into slavery. Y'all gotta give y'all the truth now, because I can go through them plantation owners. Y'all done seen the Rothschilds video. Y'all done seen, the, 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 it, the Jewish people know this history. They don't, don't get me wrong, they know this history. We got to tell the truth, family. We got to deal with it. Now watch this. A lot of the plantation owners, a lot of those that funded the slave trade, you find these Ashkenazi Jewish families. I just got to tell y'all this stuff. And I hope I hope the algorithm don't strike my video, but I got to tell y'all, the spirit of that Judah that sold Joseph into slavery has been at work. We shouldn't walk in bitterness about it because it was because of our own ancestors not keeping the covenant, right? But I just got to tell y'all what happened. Now, so we see in here that um, the Most High saw what Joseph was going, going through, and he saw those Ishmaelites arguing and doing all this stuff. And they said to each other, what is this thing that, the, that God has done to us in the road? It got pitch black out there. And they knew not that it happened because of what they were doing to Joseph. And the men proceeded on the road and they passed along the road of Ephrath where Rachel was buried. So the book of Jasher confirms that Bethlehem was where Rachel was buried. Some of y'all were emailing and saying, well, it says she died on the way, JB. Yes, she died on the way and her bones were buried in that city that she was near, which is Ephrath. Ephrath is pertaining to Ephraim. This is the author letting you know what you know today is Ephraim's borders is because their grandmother died there, died where their land is currently located. That's what I told y'all. In Genesis 14, 14, it says that Abraham pursued the five kings to Dan's territory. Dan is Abraham's great, is, is um Abraham's great grandson why is it saying he chased them to dan if dan wasn't born yet ephrath is still linked to ephraim this is the author letting you know that where ephrath are the fruitful people are is where their grandmother was buried now and joseph reached his mother's grave and joseph hurried up and ran to his mother's grave and fell upon the grave and cried now watch this now the spirit of elijah turns the hearts of the fathers to the children Whenever you remember the thing that gave you life, there is power in remembering your ancestors, remembering your tribe, remembering your history. When you turn your heart towards your ancestors, the Most High meets you. Y'all better hear me. So if you don't know who you are, you are doomed in a perpetual cycle of curses and death. That's why the nations teach us their history to keep us spiritually dead. I got to tell y'all the truth. Now Joseph reached his mother's grave and Joseph hurried up to his mother's grave. He could barely contain himself and he fell down and just started crying. Y'all y'all got to see he was overcome with such grief of what was going on. All because he had a dream. All because the Most High showed him he was the birthright son. All right. 
And Joseph cried upon his mother's grave and said, oh, my mother, my mother, you gave birth to me. Now rise and see what they're doing to me. See that they're trying to sell me as a slave and nobody cares. And I'm a kid and I don't know what's going on. And all because of a dream that the Most High showed me about me being elevated. I'm being persecuted for your namesake, oh, y'all. So remember me, my, my mother. Oh, rise and see thy son. Weep with me. Cry. Be there for me. Be my shoulder that I can cry on and see the heart of my brethren. See how vicious they are to me. Arise, my mother. So Joseph is doing all of this. Now watch this. And Joseph heard, in verse 37, a voice speaking to him from beneath the ground. If y'all haven't seen the movie Moana, oh my goodness. That is the testimony of Ephraim about the land she was a woman, right? And she became this fiery, evil spirit, right? Because she was raging because of her son. If you look at the war that's going on in the Middle East right now, y'all better talk to me. A lot of that is going on with the Jews versus the Palestinians because they didn't took the heart out of the land. That's why there's, there's always war over there. Hear me? To this day, the town of Bethlehem does not belong to the Jewish people. It belongs to the Palestinians. So the most how Rachel wouldn't even let them get the land, y'all. Even with the 1948, even with NATO, even with all the power that has been given to the great European empire. The Most High said, Satan, you can't touch my heart because Joseph ain't there. Watch this now. So he heard a voice from the ground which answered him with bitterness of heart. She was sad with him. See, we don't understand, family, the stuff that our people have gone through. Our ancestors didn't cry from the ground about this stuff. They are before the throne of the Most High Creator saying, Creator, remember us. Remember our seed. They are the angels. They are the spirit, the present that's with us, guiding us. The angelic host, right? They are pleading. They are encouraging us to come on. Y'all wake up. Turn back to your history. That's why our ancestors over there in Africa take that stuff so serious about your ancestors. And they, they take that stuff. See, we've lost that type of honor for our elders in, in, in this American westernized chaos. We didn't, we, we don't unify with one another. We kill one another. Y'all about to hit my heart on this. We kill one another. We talk evil about one another because we don't even respect our parents. We don't respect our grandparents. We're going out here just doing all this chaos because we've been cut off from our history. Our people were people of family, right? We shooting ourselves now when we got so much against us. Now watch as Joseph is pouring his heart out to his mother and she shares the same heart for him, right? And she says, my son, my son, Joseph, I have heard the voice of your crying. I hear you, son. The Most High said every tear that his children, y'all better talk. Every tear is saved in a vial. Every time you weep, the Most High got that thing. So don't think that our ancestors that had hoses pit on them and dogs sicked on them, the Most High don't still hear the crying in his ear on the throne of the magistrate on high. He hears it 24-7. While you sleeping, he's hearing your great-grandparents cry for justice. And she said, I have seen your tears and I know your troubles, my son, and it grieves me for your sake. And the abundant grief is added to my grief. Every time you hurt, I hurt and I feel that thing. But listen, my son, now therefore, my son, yourself, my son, hope in the Most High Yah, Yahweh, and wait for him and do not fear. For the Most High Yahweh is with thee. He will deliver you from trouble, my son. Now rise, my son, go to Egypt. Go into captivity knowing that I'm with you. And go there knowing that in the land of your captivity, I'm going to make you the head of the corner. Now we're going to deal with America. Watch this now. I just wanted to show y'all that. Now let's go back. So Rachel is dying. So I want y'all to catch the heart of what's going on. A lot of y'all have been sinning Psalm 78. We're going to touch that a little bit. He rejected the tabernacle of Joseph. He was going to use Shiloh as the spiritual epitaph, the spiritual headquarters for the African regathering of the 12 tribes. It was going to be at Shiloh, right? But instead, he chose Canaan, specifically Yerushalayim, specifically Zion, to be where the gathering of the people be. Does that mean he rejected Yosef in the birthright? If that's the case, he rejected Jacob. If that's the case, he rejected Isaac. Come on, y'all. We got to be a little bit smarter than that, right? That's not what Psalm 78 is saying. And some of y'all say, David, David didn't write Psalm 78. It's one of the 12 Psalms not written by David. It tells you in the first verse, a Psalm of, uh, I think it's Asaph. And we're going to go into that. But I just got to show you, y'all got to study to show yourself approved now. The Most High loves you. And even if you fight against your history, JB going to keep giving it to you because I love you and so does the Most High. Now let's keep going. Now, 
Let's go to Genesis 48. Now we saw a lot going on. That when it says that Jacob was weak, it says he's Jacob. And when he strengthened himself, it's Israel. So it's a lot of beauty in that thing. We dealt with that on the last video. Y'all check that out with Messiah Ben Joseph. So we see the blessing going on. Y'all check out that last video. I'm not going to go through the whole thing again because I start preaching. But basically, he crosses his hands and takes the younger son Ephraim and gives him the firstborn birthright. Jacob went through the same thing with his older brother um, Esau. Isaac went through the same thing with his older brother Ishmael. Notice, each one of these are the major nations that rule today. Esau is the father of the European Edomites. Ishmael is the Arabians, right? right? Moab is linked to um, Lot and his kids and that kind of thing. But all of these are Shemitic people groups today, right? The major players in world prophecy. So we went through that family. We went through how he tells you, he says, remember, son, that your grand your mother died in Canaan in Bethlehem. Now, he's telling Joseph and his his sons, Joseph's sons. So he's telling Joseph and his grandsons that that land belonged to y'all, even in Genesis 48 family. So we saw that on the last video and we saw that in Genesis 49, he gives the blessing. And we see that Judah would have the leadership of all the sons until Shiloh comes which is the people of Shiloh are the Ephraimites and unto Ephraim would be the gathering of the people family. So Judah was tasked with holding down the leadership. We saw this when Joseph was, was in slavery, that Jacob did have respect that Judah didn't kill Joseph. So Judah inherited the birthright to lead the other sons while Joseph was thought to be dead. That was what naturally happened. Spiritually in the last days, that's what Genesis 49 is about, a prophecy of the last days, Judah would rule, and we would know about Jews, we would know they're the chosen people, until Ephraim is revealed, and unto that resurrection of Ephraim, that those people would be the gathering of Israel and the world without end, right? That's the messianic prophecy that out of Ephraim would be that stone which the builders rejected. Now, we see that in Joseph's blessing. Joseph is a fruitful bowl. Now that bowl, some people take it as rainbow. Some people take it as an offshoot, like a branch, the righteous branch, right? Some people connect that branch with the bowls, like the Native American use the archers. Now we're going to see that in this prophecy. Y'all have seen natives with the bow and arrows and the fringes, right? And some people call those Nephi descendants the Niji. Niji in Japanese means rainbow. I'm telling y'all, this stuff is deep, family. So Joseph is a fruitful bow or offshoot, right? A vine, this fruitful vine, even by a well that gets into the well where the Samaritan woman, Samaria was the capital of Ephraim's territory, so she was a Josephite. She sat next to the well in John chapter 4 that was given to Joseph because most scholars believe that's where he was buried at or that's where he was put by his brothers. The pit that he was put in was this well. And his branches in the midst of the well ran over the wall and he was fruitful in the midst of the pit. That's prophetic because we know what happened in Egypt. Joseph was elevated during the time of the famine. He was the only person that could interpret spiritual purpose to other people. So he had this gift of prophetic insight into what the Most High was speaking to people in high status, in high positions of authority. Pharaoh. Pharaoh has his dream. He doesn't know what it means. None of his, his sorcerers know. Joseph, the Hebrew Israelite, knows. He understands. And this is our forefather family. And he shows Pharaoh that it means you're going to have a famine. You need somebody in charge to manage the economy of Egypt so that during the famine, you already stored enough during the fruitful years that you won't have a, a, a economic breakdown, right? Joseph becomes the vizier or nazir in Egypt. And every food that goes out of the economy, Joseph is the person over it. Over the whole Department of Agriculture, Joseph, because in the midst of the pit that was meant to kill him, the Most High raised him up, and that was the Most High's purpose the whole time. Let me show y'all the power of the Most High. He shows Joseph that he's the chief tribe, and the 13 stars bow down to him. That's why they got that 13 star star David on the back of your dollar bill. The Moors know exactly what I'm talking about. They know exactly what I'm talking about when I talk about the shield of David, about that star that's on the back of the dollar bill. Now watch this now. So Joseph has these 13 stars bow down to him and he tells his brethren, they in order to destroy that dream, pit him in a pit, but he's raised up 
in the land they sell them into captivity just for them to bow back down to him. I got to show y'all the sovereignty of the creator. That's what he did for Joseph. He became fruitful in the midst of his captivity. So whenever you say Ephraim, you're not saying doubly fruitful. You're saying, for the Most High has made me fruitful in the land of my captivity. Because the Africans understand that when they had the eight day naming ceremony, whatever was going on in the culture of that time period, whether it be for the people or at the, at the global level, all of that was taken into account when you named your children. So you were making a statement when you gave them their name. So Ephraim does not mean doubly fruitful. Ephraim means the most high Yah has made me fruitful in the land of my captivity because that's the exact statement that Joseph makes when he names Ephraim. So Ephraim carries the testimony of Joseph just as Joseph carries the testimony of Jacob, Isaac, and Abraham. Now, the archers, this is why the natives, those Cherokee, the bow and arrow was the symbol of our people. The symbolic nature of it, family, is so powerful. The archers have sorely grieved him they shot at him and hated him, but his bow abode in strength, and the arms of his hands were made strong by the hands of El Gibor, or the mighty power of Yaakobi. And from Joseph is the shepherd, the stone of Israel. That's the Messianic undertone family. So we showed that on the last video. I also connected what the rabbis teach about Messiah ben Ephraim, always going to war against Esau. We see this throughout the scriptures. We see this in Numbers. We see this in Exodus with Joshua, the son of Nun. He leads the fight against Amalek. Amalek is the grandson of Esau. So family, whenever you see Esau being troubled, it's by Joseph. We saw this in the book of Jasher. Y'all check out um, Esau and the Great Red Dragon, that series we did a while back where it talked about Zepho and we talked about Esau, how he stood against Joseph over Canaan. And Joseph had the records of his daddy. He said, I got the, the purchase book right here where, where my father purchased this land from you. So Joseph checks Esau. And whenever you see Esau bring, being brought low because Esau gets killed in that battle, which is prophetic for Joseph leading the death of the European empire. Joseph's going to do that. The so-called Negro, right? So we see that in Exodus chapter 17. And all the Jewish rabbis know America represents the far west are the Edomite, the, the daughter of Babylon, Edom itself, the chief leading Esau country is America. I showed y'all that clip by the Jewish rabbi as well. Now, Numbers 24, it talks about how this Messiah would come. Balaam sees it and tells it to Balak. Balaam was hired to curse Israel, but ends up blessing them. Watch this now. He says he pours his water out of his buckets. This is going back to the well of Joseph. That's why you have to know the layers of metaphor in the prophetic scriptures. That's how you understand prophecy. Every detail is, is intentional by the most high. So when it says he pours the water out of his buckets, he's not just saying that. He's using that to let you un remember Genesis 49. All of it is strategic, family. So they're speaking in code about Joseph. And his seed shall be in many waters. Nephi talks about his seed being in many waters in the Americas, right? And his king is going to end up being higher than Agag, the king of Esau, king of Edom. And his kingdom shall be exalted. This is the world without end. The Most High Yah brought him out of Egypt because he promised, Jacob promised Joseph, he wouldn't always be there. He hath, as it were, the strength of the rhinoceros. That's how you know that Joseph is linked to Africa. Watch this. Because the scholars pick unicorn, but if you look at the etymology, most theologians say that sounds like rhino. Watch this, and where is the rhino found today? So this one of the symbols of Joseph is the unicorn or the rhinoceros. Uh, he shall eat up the nations, <laughs> his enemies, and shall break their bones. That means that their foundation is going to be crushed. And pierce through them with many arrows. Oh, that gets into the natives. So it's almost like an aboriginal uprising. Watch this. That is led by Joseph. And it also says he couched down. He lay down as a lion. This is a shout out to Judah. Because out of Judah is Bethlehem, the town where Rachel was buried. And out of that town is an Ephraimite family that lived in Judah, which is David. And David's lineage of Ephraimites are going to be in the Americas. And out of that lineage is the dread of the nations, a black revolution. Ma, ma, what? How do they call it? Mau Mau. 
That's what J. Edgar Hoover called it, a black revolution. It's in the FBI COINTEL files of Malcolm X. Now, let's keep going. So, in Deuteronomy 33, I showed y'all also the prophecy of Joseph about the everlasting hills. He says his glory is like the firstling of his bullock, and his horns are like the horns of the unicorn. We just saw that, family, uh, when it was talking about the Messiah coming that Balaam saw. Balaam said, I see him, but not now. I shall behold him, but not nigh. Right? That's the whole Numbers chapter 22 through 24. So he says, with his horns, he's going to gather the people together from the ends of the earth. They are the ten thousands of Ephrati, and they are the thousands of Manasseh. Now, where have we heard that before? Let me show y'all something real quick. Now, there was a tale that was told with King David and King Saul that he has slain his... Wait, let me show y'all. Let me show you. Because they knew David's family, and they knew David was an Ephraimite. And we're going to pull this thing up in Psalms. So in Psalms chapter 89, uh, beginning at verse 27, right? He shall cry unto me, thou art my father, my power, and the rock of my salvation. Now that rock of my salvation is the shepherd rock that we read about with the prophecy of Joseph. David speaking from his heart in this moment. He, he's feeling crushed in this moment. All his enemies have surrounded him. All those have hated him for no reason. Now watch this. Also, I will make him my firstborn. Now watch this. David is speaking. He says, he shall cry unto me. Thou art my father, my God, and the rock of my salvation. Now who is talking to who here? This is a messianic prophecy. Now we already know in Isaiah 9, it says that we will call Yeshua. The mighty God, or El Gibor. The El Gibor that we just saw about Joseph. But yet, he's saying that he's saying unto me, Thou art my father. He shall cry unto me, Thou art my father, my God. Who is he talking about? His descendant would be the image of the invisible God, the promised Messiah, the rock of, the, of my salvation. This is a messianic promise. Also, I will make him my firstborn. Y'all got to check this higher than the kings of the earth we saw that with agag with the prophecy it said he has his bucket he has he has buckets of many waters right and his king is higher than agag and he's the firstborn this is joseph all over it family it got so much it's just ridiculous right so the most high is saying this messiah figure from david's loins will be the rock of salvation will be the mighty god el gibor would be abba in flesh now this is that, that black messiah watch this now and I will make him my firstborn. So when y'all say Boaz's physical lineage was Judah, nobody's arguing it. The Most High said I made him Ephraim because of the kinsman redeemer. Y'all better hear me. So, but what else do we see in this? Now, let me, let me stay in Psalms a little bit. No, 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 it's not in Psalms, it's in 1 Samuel. So back to that Deuteronomy. So we see in Deuteronomy 33, so many uh, precepts, man. So we see in Deuteronomy 33, he says the 10,000s of Ephraim and the thousands of Manasseh. Now, let's go to 1 Samuel. Let me show y'all something. So in 1 Samuel, chapter 33, not chapter 33, uh, chapter 18, beginning at verse 7. Now, this is what they were saying about David and Saul. David was legendary. He was a warrior prince, a warrior king. That Ephraimite blood was pumping through his, his veins. Now watch this. And the women answered one another as they played their harps and said, Saul has slain his thousands and David his ten thousands. This was a rallying cry, not just for David, but his whole family, his the whole town of Bethlehem. That's why Saul did not like that thing. It rallied Jesse's house. It rallied Jesse's sons, the eight sons, David, because it was the very number of Ephraim was ten thousand. All of the tribes knew that ten thousand was so so prominent for Ephraim because it goes back to what Moses said. Moses talked about the ten thousands of Ephraim and the thousands of Manasseh. Where did Moses get it from? He got it from Jacob in Genesis 48 that talks about the ten thousands of Ephraim. Let's see if we can find it.
All right, family. So we see that David is given that number of 10,000s and Saul does not like that thing, but it's a metaphor alluding back to Ephraim. Now, the next precept I want to show you guys. So we've seen all the prophecies concerning the Messiah out of Joseph's lineage. Going back to Rachel being buried in Bethlehem, that Ephraimite family there, going into the, the promise and the firstborn blessing that Jacob gave to Ephraim, going all the way to the promise that he gave to Joseph in Genesis 49. Exodus shows us that Joshua the Ephraimite fought against um, Amalek. We see that Agag was also a king that will be brought down with Joseph. We see that in Numbers. We see Moses' blessing of the ten thousands of Ephraim, which was given to David in 1 Samuel. Now, why did David get given this? We already looked at the book of Ruth. In the book of Ruth, verse 2 of the first chapter, it talks about this Ephraimite family in Bethlehem. I showed y'all a source from the Jewish history department in Tel Aviv, Jerusalem. Watch this. By Nadav Naaman, the Department of Jewish History and Tel Aviv University. I found this on JSTOR, a very credible online article uh, website. It talks about Rachel dying in that region. We saw in Jasher 42, it tells you she was buried there. She was buried in Bethlehem and a group of Ephraimites settled there. These are the Ephrathites. Now watch this, Ephraimites slash Ephraimites. Ephraimite slash Ephrathites. The Jewish scholars know this history family. So that is what's going on in the book of Ruth. We see these Ephraim Ephraimites settle in the highland country. Every city that belongs to Judah is listed in Joshua 15. Uh, Bethlehem is not included because Joshua was giving them the land and Joshua was an Ephraimite. Why would he give you the most holiest town where his grandmother died at? Why would he give that to another tribe? Come on, y'all. We got to use common sense. So Joshua is parting the land, which is also an allusion to the Messiah ben Ephraim that would lead the people back to the land and organize the tribes. So Joshua does this as an Ephraimite, and he gives this town to Ephraim. So this is what's going on in the book of Ruth. You have this Ephraimite family that goes to Moab. That's that Moabite blood that the Moors know about, right? They go to Moab during the time of the famine. <laughs> excuse me and then they return but naomi returns by herself her husband died elimelech the ephraimite the sons died right it's a sad event and she didn't have anybody to give her right to her own land now we see this a lot in african culture um where if a husband dies the the husband's family his brothers whoever's nearest akin can take all of his property right and if they don't have the spirit of the most high it can get very gruesome because whenever somebody dies, especially in our community, it can get very nit nitpicky, picky, gritty over who's going to get what. Folks fighting, family members want to slash each other's throats and all this stuff, family. And we're family, right? But greed and selfishness can creep in when our family dies. So we see this happen with Naomi's husband, Elimelech, right? We see that when he dies, she fears that she ain't going to have nothing. And Boaz who is the nearest of kin, has mercy for her and her daughter-in-law, Ruth. They end up getting married, and the Leverite states that that lineage, Obed, belongs to the deceased. So a lot of y'all have gone to um, Ruth chapter 4 and says, well, JB, you saying that David was Ephraimite. It says that Boaz's lineage was coming back from Hezron and Judah. E exactly. But we know, based on African tradition, based on Israelite culture, right, that the person that's marrying the Levirate, that child that they have together, that child's lineage goes back to the deceased. So like if my cousin who is the fourth, um, if his wife died and I married his wife, that son would be my cousin, the fifth, right? That's Af Nobody else on earth practices that except for the African Israelites over there in Nigeria. They practice this, right? Heavily. Wow. Y'all check out Castle and Castle on Netflix. It gives you great just it breaks that thing down about african culture um it's a fun series but it does go into that as well now so we see in first samuel 17 12 that it says now david was the son of that ephrathite which is ephraimite from bethlehem judah now let me show y'all something real quick now a lot of y'all say what well, says ephrathite jb it says ephrathite i know it says ephrathite let me show you something That word Ephrathite that's used, we're looking in the Blue Bible, um, Strong's Concordance. 
It says, Ephrathite equals ash, ashiness or fruitfulness. We know it means fruitfulness that was pertaining to Ephraim. It is inhabitant or a descendant of Ephraim. So if you inhabited Ephraim's territory, Mount Ephraim, Shiloh, those different cities, then you were an Ephrathite. Or if you were a descendant of Ephraim, you are an Ephrathite. Or you could have been a descendant of Ephraim in Bethlehem, right? Or an inhabitant of Bethlehem. Because you had Ephraimites that were in Judah because Rachel was buried, their grandmother, in Bethlehem. And you also had Ephraim's original borders that a lot of Ephraim was in, y'all. That's that history. We also see this confirmed by the Strong's Concordance as well. It talks about Ephrati is the actual word in the Hebrew. So the Moroccans speak ancient Hebrew when they call themselves Ha'afrati, right? They are going back to the original language when they say that. But in the English, Ephrati translates to Ephrathite or Ephraimite. It's the same word. Ephrathite means pertaining to Ephraim. It's a gentilic form that the people pertaining to Ephraim that lived in Bethlehem, right? Now, we also see that in the King James Bible Dictionary.com. Um, and I showed y'all that article on JSTOR. Uh, I had another copy of that up. Um, the Department of Jewish History also goes into that. Now, I also want to show y'all something very powerful. Now, this is the Jewish Encyclopedia. Now, well, not this one. It's another site. Oh, here we go. Oh, yeah, brother. Now, let me make sure I let y'all know where I'm getting this from. The Jewish Encyclopedia.com. It goes through Ephraim. Um, his name means to be fruitful in the land of captivity. I already showed y'all the scriptures. Now, let's scroll down a little bit. Oh, yeah. Y'all gonna get a good Bible study lesson. Now, now this is rabbinic literature. Now, watch this. I couldn't even find these books that they list, family. They're gonna quote some books like Leverite number two. I couldn't find it. If y'all can find it, y'all comment down below. In imparting the blessing, Jacob said to Ephraim, Ephraim, the heads of the tribes, the chiefs of the Yeshabbat, and the best and most prominent of my children shall be called after your name. Now, this is consistent with the birthright. It's basically saying that the most noblest of, of Jacob's children are going to be named after Ephraim because of the birthright. Now, watch this. Joshua, Deborah, Barak, Samuel, because Samuel won one. Joshua, we already know, led him to the promised land. Deborah was in Ephraim, Barak, Messiah ben Joseph, and Messiah ben David were Ephraimites. Oh my goodness, y'all. I said, where'd they get the Jews got this stuff, family? Now, why would they call themselves Jews and they know the secret is David's an Ephraimite? Because they trying to cause our people to chase after one thing when they know the truth. Now, let me hurry up because that fan's starting to get going. I got so much I want to give y'all. Let me, let me go now. Let's go to the Book of Mormon real quick. I got to go on and show y'all the peace de la resistance. I got to show y'all these things. Let me pull it up. Now, first of all, let me show y'all identity regained. Black man, you are Ephraim. Now, let me see if I can pull this up. Now, I couldn't find this book nowhere. If y'all ever find this book, Identity Regained, Black Man, You're Ephraim, please, please give me the link. Uh, you get the book yourself. I need y'all to get it. I know I've been getting, I, mean, I got to get these books. I got to get these books. If you get it, get it. Somebody get the book so Israel can have it because it's not on Amazon right now. It goes into the Native Americans, those being ancient African Moors that came over here that were led by the Most High, Nephi, and those that were brought from Nigeria. It goes into it, but I can find this book nowhere. Abe's bookstore doesn't even have it, right? So it goes into this history family beautifully. Um, I just wanted to bring that up. Now, let me jump into the Book of Mormon real quick. Let me show y'all something. Now, this is the Book of Mormon. Let me just make sure y'all know. So y'all can know. Now, let me show y'all a mystery in here real quick. Now, oh, not more. <laughs> let me go to America. Let me show you something. Now, the Book of Moor men is the men of the Moors. Now, watch this. I'm dropping a nugget for you. Because it is a volume of Holy Scripture comparable to the Bible. It's a different record set of that, what was going on with Northern Kingdom. It is a record of the Most High Yah's dealings with ancient inhabitants of the Americas. Oh, wait a second. Why would white folks say that this book is dedicated to how the Most High dealt with the ancient inhabitants of the Americas if this was written by white folks? This is the Book of Mormon now. I'm telling y'all, it's the equivalent to the Bible, how they made it white. But if you read it, it says, he that led into captivity gonna go into captivity. So I know the white man didn't write that. 
Now watch this now. Or I am black but beautiful and all the other stuff in the scriptures. He wouldn't have wrote that. Now let's watch this. After thousands of years, they had already been over here for thousands of years. All were destroyed except the Lamanites. And they are among the ancestors of the American Indians. Now watch this now. Watch this. Now let me go to. Let me pull this up in the sealed portion of Ephraim. I want y'all to get this. Right. Now let me show y'all something in here. Because I'm going to show y'all these are records. That the white man didn't, didn't whitewashed and the nations didn't try to hide from you. But the most high bringing it out. On, we, 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 Zion Dynasty, we're going to deal with these things. And shout out to Elder Ayil and Big Judah and so many of y'all that's doing this great scholarship. Now watch this. Chapter 31 of the sealed portion. The rise of the great Roman Empire and the explanation of the great beast by John. Wait a second. The Roman Empire. The Roman Empire is one beast. And the great European Empire and the United States are the other beast. Now watch this family. I told y'all. The first captivity was Egypt. We know about the Egyptian. But when and after that was Assyria. Assyria led Northern Kingdom. But the statue that Daniel saw. It started with Babylon. That was the first people that took Judah. Then the Medes and the Persians. Then the Greeks and the Romans. Then the Roman Empire. Now. Daniel saw that statue with the head of gold, which was Babylon, the chest of silver, which is the Medes and the Persians, the abdomen of brass, which is the Greeks, and the legs of iron, which is the Romans, and the ten toes, which was iron mixed with clay. That's the Neo-Roman Empire. Some of y'all think it's the Catholic Church. The Catholic Church is the false prophetic system of the beast, but it is not the beast. The beast is linked to the ten toes. The ten toes is in reference to the country of the 10 northern kingdom tribes which was given to them which is the americas and the land of their captivity going back to joseph's prophecy now watch this so those 10 toes is the 10 founding european countries one of y'all commented and said well there's 12 founding countries in nato yes 10 of those were the european countries I, so that was a good comment i want to deal with that in the lesson so that last ruling empire is the Neo-Roman Empire founded by NATO. Now, why does the Book of Mormon got that in here if it was written by white folks? Why would they say that the United States is the beast? So, wait, 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 wait. So, European white folks wrote that their, their country is the beast system? And then we're going to read it. Oh, I just wanted to show y'all just the summary caption, right? Now, during, now, 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 watch this. The Great European Empire is the seventh beast. America is the eighth. So the great European empire is Great Britain. Watch this because Great Britain was the epitome of the first European empire, the seventh beast. And the book of Revelation tells you that the eighth beast would come out of the seventh. Well, watch this now. So th these books fill in the missing pieces. Just like I told y'all, Daniel saw the four beasts, but the fourth beast, he wasn't given an animal. In the Apocrypha, which is another seal, we see Ezra says that fourth beast that Daniel saw, it's really the eagle. What? Now, how come white folks took the Apocrypha out again? Because they knew that they are the devil that the Bible speaks of. I just got to tell y'all the truth. And I'm not talking about every single one. Some of y'all might think, take that some type of way. But the majority of them folks is the devil. And their empire is absolutely fueled by Satan himself. Watch this. And the scripture is going to tell you. So that fourth beast is the eagle. And the book of Obadiah. Let me pull it up. I got the Bible up. Oh, man. That's why I love doing these screen records. We can do some good Bible lesson because we're going to line this thing up precept upon precept. Let me go to Obadiah and read it for y'all because y'all think I'm making it up. The vision of Obadiah, thus saith the Most High Yahweh Elohim concerning Edom. Edom is Esau. It means red. Oh, <laughs> I'm telling y'all, Edom means red. We have heard a rumor from the Most High and an ambassador is sent from among the heathen to say what's going to happen to you. Prepare battle against Edom. Now this was going to happen. The Most High said, I'm going to declare war against you. Let me go ahead and expose you. Behold, I have made you small among the heathen, but you are greatly despised. So when they try to make our people the smallest people on earth and that we only disprecent, white folks know they the minority. Watch this now. Verse 3. The pride of your heart has deceived you. You that dwell in the Caucasus mountains, I mean the clefts of the rock, whose habitation is high. And you said in your heart, who going to bring you down? Now watch this. You exalt yourself as the eagle. So we see in 2 Ezra 6, 9 that Esau is the end of the world and Jacob is the beginning of the world to come. Apocalypse. The X-Men villain Apocalypse, that's the Negro Messiah. Thanos, 
That's the Negro Messiah. Dark side, that's the... I'm telling y'all, I'm going to expose the whole thing. Watch this now. They know that the apocalypse is Jacob being born out of the ashes of the ego that is consumed by the judgment that is the thermonuclear destruction that's going to come upon her head. Watch this. The very bombs that they making are going to be the bombs the most high. Oh, oh man, oh, man. So thou exalt yourself as the eagle. That's that fourth beast that Daniel saw. That's in Daniel chapter 7, if y'all want to read that. Also, in 2 Ezra chapter 11 and 12, it goes into this eagle that comes out of the sea. We see that in Revelation 13 that says the beast will come out of the sea. That beast is America. The second beast, right? The first beast is ancient Rome. The second beast is the great European empire that is led by America and NATO. I'm dropping some bombs for y'all now. So thou that exalts yourself as the eagle, we know this is America because watch this. You set your nest in the stars. What did Neil Armstrong say? The eagle has landed? White folks know who they are. And this is in the Book of Mormon, so we know white folks didn't write that. Now watch this now. I just had to show y'all that real quick. Now let's go back to our records. The stick of Ephraim real quick, because it shows all these things. The United States. Now, now, now let me read. Let's go down in, in, in chapter 31 real quick. Now, let me go to verse 57. Let me show y'all something. Now, and now I would that you should understand the words that John talked about when he talked about that beast that comes out of the sea in Revelation 13, pertaining unto these great nations of which I have spoken, which shall be set up in the earth in order to give Satan the time of his power. Wait a second. The Gentiles are set up for Satan? Why would white folks write this again? I got to show y'all these show books. They didn't told you don't fool with the Book of Mormon because they ain't read it. Now watch this. Verse 58. And John wrote of the Roman Empire, saying, And I stood upon the sand of the sea and saw a beast come out the sea. Now, y'all, let me show y'all something. I, I knew about Revelation 13 before I knew this was even written. I had already read that, and I had taught lessons to y'all about the beast coming out of the sea being Rome. I had not read this. When I saw this, and, and I all pray to the Most High, an elder, a yield, brought this thing out on one of his lessons, and I said, What? It said the beast that came out of the sea is wrong, but the white man wrote this? Watch this now. No, he found the plates, and they tried to keep it amongst themselves because they knew it was your history. Having seven heads and ten horns. Now, this goes to the ten horns. You can read about that in Ezra, about the eagle that comes out the sea. And upon his horns, ten crowns, and blasphemy all over his head. Everything that could be against God, America doing it. The LGBT community, gay, same-sex marriage, trying to create robots, killing God's people on the street unarmed, just everything, America doing all of it. All blasphemy. Watch this now. And the beast which I saw was like a leopard, but he had the feet of a bear and the mouth of a lion. This is where you got to know Daniel chapter 7. That beast, Rome, took every element of every empire that came before them, took that wisdom, and used it to pit the black man in captivity. You hear me? The way that they took a false people and showed you these are the Native Americans, man, Assyria had been doing that in the Bible days. Assyria took false people and put them in the land. What else America did? The way they had God's people in slavery for 400 years, man, Egypt had already done that. The way they changed Kuta Kente name to Toby, man, Babylon did that to Daniel and the three Hebrew boys. Y'all better hear me. America took all that wisdom to keep your black behind enslaved. That's why it, the four beasts was a lion with eagle's wings, a bear, a leopard, and then that eagle. But that eagle got, 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 look kind of like a leopard. So he a leopard body. Now that same statue is outside the UN. I will pick that picture up. But at the time of me uploading this, y'all check out those other videos. Y'all have seen Google the UN beast. It's a leopard with eagle's wings. I'm telling you, they know who they are. They know they're the revival of the Roman Empire, the Renaissance. That's why you got the white Jesus, which is really, um, What's that man name? White Jesus is, um, dang. Um, the Borgia, Caesar Borgia and all that, that was killed with a sword wound but lives because they gave him the life of Yeshua. Watch this now. So, and the dragon gave America his seat and great authority. Now, I got to show y'all. So, why would white folks write this? Why would white folks write that the Roman Empire is linked to America? The United States of America? Why would they put that in their in chapters? Now watch this. Why would they put that if this is the white man's book? All right, in chapter 31, in case y'all want to go back behind me and read this. Now let's go to verse 81. Let me show y'all something. And now I, Marani, of the house of Joseph, 
Native American, the original Americans, the Aboriginal, have seen the words of Yahukanan or John, which have been given in the Sefer, the book, the Bible. And I would that you should remember the words of Nephi, his, his um, forefather, which he wrote saying, Thou seest that after the book has gone forth through the hands of the great and abominable church. He talking about the Bible. So they call him the European church, the devil. The same church that persecuted our forefathers in Spain, in Africa, and in the Americas is the devil. Watch this. And that there are made many plain and precious things taken away from the book, which is in the book of the Lamb of the Most High God. So it tells you they took stuff out of the book. That's why these are records. These are the seven seals. When you talk about the Bible, the Apocrypha, right? The Pearl of the Great Price, Doctrines and Covenants, the Book of Mormon, the seal portion, and the seal portion of Ephraim. These are the seals that have to be unlocked in the last days to bring about the revelation, to bring about the end of days. Those seals that were unlocked in the book of Revelation, that's our people turning back to our records to expose the Gentiles for who they really are. Watch this now. So he says a lot of these things were taken out of the scriptures, right? Now, let me show y'all another witness. Now, this is in Doctrines and Covenants, section 45. Now, we're going we gonna to go to this now. It talks about the gospel being restored, the times of the Gentiles being fulfilled. We know the Gentiles is that great Roman Empire. Now, let's go down. But they shall be gathered again, talking about the Israelites, but they shall remain until the times of the Gentiles be fulfilled. So we're going to stay in our present state until Esau's reign is over with. Right? And in that day shall be heard wars, rumors of wars. Uh, the whole earth shall be in commotion and the men's hearts shall fail them. And they shall say that Christ delays his coming. They're going to say, man, he ain't coming. Christ ain't coming. Verse 28. And when the times of the Gentiles come in, a light shall break forth among them that sit in darkness. This truth coming out. But some of them shall not receive it, for they perceive not the light, and they turn their hearts from men because of the precepts of men. So they so caught up in the Christianity juice, lost in the sauce, that some of our people just ain't going to, y'all call them the two-thirds, they just ain't going to receive this. And in that generation shall the times of the Gentiles be fulfilled, and there shall be men standing in that generation that shall not pass until they shall see an overflowing scourge for a desolating sickness shall cover the land. Let me drop a nugget for y'all. And 2019 was the fulfillment of the 400 years. I used to think COVID-19 meant, watch this, COVID, the 19th variant of the virus. That ain't what it means. COVID-19 is an American political agenda. It's a COVID-19 is a cold phrase. This is oh man. COVID-19 means the COVID-19 agenda. Watch this. COVID of 2019. The same year that they're preparing for the curses that have been lifted. This is in the Book of Mormon, y'all. Oh man, oh man. <laughs> I got to show y'all this. No, this ain't all I got to show you. Let me go back to the seal portion. Let me show y'all something real quick. I can go to chapter. Let me see. Let's see something. Yeah, I don't like using the online version. It's hard to search these chapters in here. Let's see so. All right, family. So now we're in the sealed portion. It's hard to navigate online like this on this thing. It won't let me really search the keywords. 
But now we're in the sealed portion, chapter 31. Now let me show y'all something. Chapter 31, we're gonna go down to verse 57. I gotta scroll the long way, y'all. Y'all bear with me. Now, and now I would that you should understand the words of John pertaining unto these great nations of which I have spoken, which shall be set up upon the earth in order to give Satan his time of power and glory. So why is white folks writing this again? I'm just, I keep saying it to let y'all know, this was not written by the white man. This was written by your ancestors. This is the record of your forefathers, the house of Joseph. They gave us this love letter because of the love that the father has for us so that we would know these things in the last days. Now, and Yahoo Kanan wrote of the Roman empire and stood upon the sand of the sea. Now watch this. Now we just went through this, but I just wanted to go back to this. So we see family that the Roman empire is that beast, that great European empire that would come out of the sea. Now, now, now why did I bring all of that up? All of that is the very book that they say does not belong to us. They say that, oh, don't mess with the Book of Mormon. Now, why did I bring that out? Because these records of Joseph show us the end of days and the beginning of days. The first empire that took over Israel was the Assyrians. The Assyrians targeted the 10 Northern Kingdom tribes. The last, watch this. The last empire is the ten toes of the statues of Daniel, of the statue of Daniel, which is the um, NATO or the beast that comes out of the sea, the Neo-Roman Empire. So Joseph is the first and the last, the first fruit, the end, right? So now when a lot of y'all are seeing these Josephite prophecies, a lot of y'all don't understand the two stick prophecy. Now, the Book of Mormon that a lot of y'all don't want to believe and don't and think that it ain't true is the record of Ephraim and what happened to Northern Kingdom. It shows you the beginning and the end of Northern Kingdom. The account of Southern Kingdom, the Jews, right? This is the Israelites versus the Jews, the 10 tribes versus the two, right? The record of Jews or Judah is the Judeo scriptures that you have that goes into detail about the Babylonian empire, the Medo-Persian empire, the Greco-Roman empire. But that Assyrian, what happened to the 10 tribes, and America, you don't see detail on that until you connect that with the Book of Mormon. Now, let me show y'all this two-stick prophecy real quick. And then we're going to wrap up today's lesson. Because I know this was a lot for y'all to investigate for yourself, pray about, seek the Most High's wisdom about. Now, let's go to Ezekiel 37. Now, I got to show y'all something legendary. Now, before I go to Ezekiel, oh, wait, wait, wait. <laughs> we're going to go to 1 Samuel first. We're going to go to 1 Samuel first. Because I want y'all to see something real quick. 1st Samuel, y'all bear with me. 1st Samuel, what chapter is it? I think it's chapter 18. No, it's chapter 17. I already had that chapter up. Okay, so in 1st Samuel 17, we're going to see David go against Goliath. Now, we already see in verse 12 that it says, Now David was the son of that Ephrathite. Now, I didn't already show y'all a mystery on that. Let me, let me go ahead and show you. Uh, let me find those scriptures. Let me show y'all that Ephrathite means Ephraimite real quick in case y'all didn't know. And the CEB Bible. Now David was the son of Jesse's son and Ephraimite from Bethlehem in Judah. So he's the lion of Judah. His blood is Ephraim. I just had to show y'all. That's the CEB Bible. In case y'all think it's just that translation. The NRIV. Or N-I-R. Yeah, N-R-I-V. David was the son of Jesse who belonged to the tribe of Ephraim. They make it even more claim plain jesse was from however bethlehem and judah and, and the brother posted that scripture where um he had the levite that was in bethlehem so that shows you that they were in different tribes levi was spread throughout all the tribes that's why levi was there ephraim is there because rachel's rachel their foremother died in bethlehem the lsv bible they kicked me out of the scripture let me go to first samuel real quick first samuel chapter 17 verse 12 all right let's find it and David, son of this Ephraimite of Bethlehem, Judah. So y'all, it, it just makes it so much claim. But we, I want to go back to that scripture to show y'all something. That same chapter. It talks about David, the Ephrathite or the Ephraimite of Bethlehem. Now let's go down to when he fights against Goliath. I'm going to show y'all something about these two sticks. Excuse me. Now, let's go to it when David gets the slingshot. 
David said, what, is there not a cause? David trying to go out there and fight him. Now, let's get to when he goes to him. Now, oh, he says in verse 36, that servant, your servant, I slew both the lion and the bear, and this uncircumcised Philistine is going to be just like them. Now, the story of that is when David was watching over his sheep of his father's house, and um, the lion came on one instance, and a bear came, and David took a slingshot and killed both of them jokers. Right? Now, watch this. Let's get to when he challenges Goliath. I, I got to show y'all something that I have never seen before. Now, now watch this. And the Philistine, in verse 41, came on and drew near unto David, and the man that bare the shield went before him. And when the Philistine looked about, he said, man, this is a kid. A little bit of kid. Because he was just a youth. And he was ruddy. He had a little nice complexion. A little light brown. He was fair, fair countenance. And the Philistine said unto David, am I a dog? That y'all send this baby out here with staves? Now, when you see that word staves, you might not see a mystery that the Most High put. Let me go back to that LSV and show you something real quick. Now, let's go to that same verse in the LSV where it makes it more plain Let me make sure I got the verse up verse 40 verse 40 now and the Philistine verse 42 looks attentively and sees David and despises him because he's a youth and he's ruddy with a handsome appearance and the Philistine says to David, am I a dog that you are coming to me with sticks? Now, I know y'all probably didn't catch what just happened. What did David come against this Philistine with? A slingshot and five stones. So he has five stones in one hand and he got a slingshot in the other hand. Now, we're just going based on the story. What is a slingshot? Oh, no, oh boy, boy, boy. <laughs> A slingshot is one stick, y'all, and it has a Y at the end, right? Where you put the rubber band in it, or you put the little, little, they got a fancy contraction where you can kind of, but it's one stick, family. Now, why did the Philistines say, why are you coming against me with sticks, plural? Oh my goodness, some of y'all still ain't caught it. Watch this. Now, let's go to Ezekiel real quick. Let me show y'all something. Some of y'all like, oh my goodness, JB. Watch this now. Y'all don't, wait, 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 wait. All right. Now, in Ezekiel 37, this is what the Most High came to Ezekiel saying in verse 16. Moreover, son of man, take you one stick and write upon it for Judah. <laughs> These are records. The stick represents like a tree. The roots, genealogy, the records of the genealogy. Watch this and what happens to the family. So son of man, take you one record, take you one stick and write upon it for Judah and for the children of Israel that were associated with Judah, Benjamin and Levi, some of the priests. Then take another stick and write upon it for Joseph, the stick of Ephraim, the ten tribes and for all the house of Israel that are with Joseph. So the house of Israel was with Joseph and Judah had Benjamin and Levi, the ten tribes, the two tribes. Watch this. Verse 17. And join them one another into one stick, and they shall be one stick in my hand. Oh man, I got something for y'all. Now let's go to verse 19. Thus saith the Most High Yahweh, Behold, I will take the stick of Yosef, which is in the hand of Ephraim. Pay attention to that which is in the hand of Ephraim. And the tribes of Israel, his fellows, and I will put them with him, even with the stick of Judah, and make them one stick and they shall be one in my hand. Watch this. A lot of y'all still didn't catch it. The Most High has a stick that's in the hand of Ephraim. He takes another stick and attaches it to it. I think y'all seeing it. It's a Y. Watch this. But the stick is in the hand of Ephraim. And you're taking the stick of Judah and attaching it. And the person holding that authority, when all 12 tribes are come together, is Ephraim. But wait, the Most High says it shall be one in my hand. So the Lord, the Most High's hand is Ephraim. But this is a messianic prophecy of all 12 tribes coming together. That's why I brought it up in Joseph. Watch this. That's why I brought it up with David. With the slingshot. 
he says the Philistines seized two sticks, but David only got one. But the Most High said I would take the two sticks and make it one in my hand. But David's holding the stick. But it's Ephraim holding the stick. Oh, man. Let me go back up. Let me go back. Let me go back. Let me go back to 1 Samuel. And 1 Samuel chapter 12, it said, man, let me go to the LSV. In 1 Samuel chapter 12, I mean, chapter 17, verse 12, it says, let me make sure I got it. It says, and David, the son of the Ephraimite of Bethlehem. And then you got the Philistine that says, why you got sticks in your hand? Watch this. The two sticks prophecy is about Ephraim rejoining his records from Judah with the records of the rest of Northern Kingdom in Ephraim's hand, the Ephraimite Messiah, which will be the coming of the Most High, which is David's lineage family. You got David holding one stick, but the enemy sees two because it's two records. That's the slingshot that the Messiah ben David, who is Ephraim, is going to use to conquer the nations with rejoining the 12 tribes through rejoining their genealogical records. This is the Book of Mormon and the Judeo scriptures. This is the Sefer, the Apocrypha, all the hidden books being restored back to our people, all 12 tribes coming together. Ephraim leading the way as the birthright tribe and the hand of an Ephraimite descendant which is David with the slingshot in his hand which is two sticks but one stick boy 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 this is all of our people coming back together family by getting our records but it also proves that the hand of the most high is going to do this the glove if you will is Ephraim family and David is that beautiful love story, the beautiful manifestation of that when he goes against the, the uh, Philistine and he has the slingshot, which is one stick, but it appears as two because it's the two sticks coming together, which David was the only king to rule with all 12 tribes united and his descendant would do the same thing. And Ephraimite descendant, which we saw in Deuteronomy 33, uh, that in Deuteronomy 33, 17, that Ephraim would be the regathering of the people or the fullness of the Gentiles. He would push the people together from the ends of the earth, right? Shiloh, that gathering of the people, Shiloh being the city of Ephraim. It was rejected for the Ephraimite family that lived in Judah and Judah was chosen. This is Psalm 78. So family, I know this was a lot family. I know I went through a lot of scriptures, a lot of history. I hope y'all took a lot of notes. Um, so I, the two sticks is our people's records coming back together and all 12 tribes coming back together, knowing who we are in the hand of the Ephraimite Messiah, David's descendants. We are the descendants of that people. This is why J. Edgar Hoover had the COINTEL Pro against the Black Messiah. So everything comes full circle. This is the Messiah Ben Ephraim Ben Joseph mystery. It's really one stick in the hand of the Most High. So I hope y'all got something out of it. I hope y'all took great notes. Um, y'all comment if y'all want me to postpone the Sefer giveaway so more people can get involved. I know there's a lot to ask for somebody. Also, I'm going to have that link partnering with the Sefer company where y'all can purchase them directly from Zion Dynasty. So family, I love you all with the love of the Messiah. Peace, love, blessings, and Israelite power to the 12 tribes scattered but one stick in the hand of the Most High. I love you all with the love of the Messiah. Peace, love, blessings. Shalom. All praise.